Pastor Blake is always such a good sport, isn't he? All right. How many people have your Bible today? Amen. That's beautiful. Turn around. Show your Bible to somebody. All right. You may be seated, please. How many people are excited about being at church today? Now, the thing about church, when we come to church, uh, a lot of people have this idea in their mind that as they come to church, I need to leave so encouraged. I need to leave so encouraged about who I am in the Lord. But I will tell you something. More times than not, when I leave church, and my church starts before yours does as I'm preparing for the sermon, I can't say encouraged is always what I am. Sometimes I'm convicted. Most times he shows me myself and then I begin to be encouraged about what I can do about getting closer to God. So it's not something that always makes you feel good. In the same way that a loving father, when a loving father takes care of his child, it's not always looked on as the child as something they look forward to, but something that's needed. So today as we come together, I want to talk to you basically looking at the idea of what kind of package am I? knowing that we're going to talk about being delivered, what kind of package am I? And I'm going to ask you today to be able to, to open your mind to what God's Word says. When someone says to you or to me, you know, who is Jesus Christ to you? Who is Jesus Christ to you? What a, what a broad question, who is Jesus Christ to me? The first thing that we always want to say is, He is my Savior, right? Now, how many people would claim, who is Jesus to me? He is my Savior, Would you claim it enough and and be excited enough to to raise your hand? To raise your hand high? You're happy about him being your savior, right? But in thinking about this and listening to somebody give this response, and I had to think about myself. You know, I would give that same response, but then as I began to think, I would have to say, unless I went further in my explanation, then I haven't accurately described the role of Jesus Christ in my life. I would have to say, not just that he is my savior, I would have to say he is my deliverer. But I don't think we we go on and go the further explanation. I think savior and everybody thinks about it. Is he my savior? Absolutely. And you know, I don't doubt that he is my savior. I can tell you through my Christian life, I have not had a problem with being able to reflect and say, I know that one day, About 40 years ago, I cried out to God and I said, God, I am lost. I'm separated from you. I am a sinner, but I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe the only way for me to get to you is for me to claim his blood and ask you to use his blood to cover my sins. Lord, I I need to be saved. Jesus, will you come into my heart and and save me and be Lord of my life? I remember when that happened, and I have never had a problem with my salvation. But get this. After I was saved, I've had some problems. I haven't had problems with the saving part. I've had problems with my life after the saving part. If this is only for me, that's okay. But can anybody else relate? I thought maybe you could. You see, what I need to show you today out of God's word is that he didn't come into to my life and your life only to save you. His purpose was to save you and to deliver you. Now, I want to give you a definition of deliver. Because we put deliver in this broad context and say, he delivered them out of bondage. He delivers us. And that's right. He does deliver us. That means he saved us out of that current situation. But deliver is not a past tense word. Webster's definition of deliver. To transport goods purchased free to an address as instructed. Isn't that what a mailman does? Isn't that what a, a, a UPS FedEx guy does? They transport goods purchased free to an address as instructed. And then the next one, it says to convey something to a person to whom it is destined. I like that too. And then the next one, to fulfill a promise. 
to deliver, to fulfill a promise. So I want to tell you this morning, he is emphatically my Savior. Matthew 1, 21, it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. You don't need to even, I'm going to go over a couple right here. You're going to end up at another place in the Bible. So if you want to mark it down, you can. But I'm trying to tell you, he was sent to be a savior. Even the angel told Joseph, the angel told Mary, right? And then Paul said in Acts 4, 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus is the only name by where you can be saved. So it talks about him being a savior. But what I want us to see today, he doesn't just save us. He delivers us from our sins. And I wanted to give you this children's sermon because I want you to see this picture. He doesn't just rescue us and leave us laying there. He carries us and strengthens us and ultimately delivers us to God. If I were to look at myself in trouble, drowning, and I couldn't, I, I couldn't make it, and I was going under, and Jesus reached in and saved me from drowning and threw me on the bank. Yes, He saved me. But I was left there. You see, He doesn't just save me. He picks me up and takes me to where I need to go. Or does He, does he take me? Well, I've always thought that He just takes me where I need to go. I want to show you today that that's not even the case. I want to challenge our our ordinary thinking because I think it leaves us in a place of complacency to where we have this mindset in our minds that yes, he saved me then and one day I'm going to show up in heaven and I'll walk on the pearly, on the the golden streets and I'll open the pearly gates and there's this big gap between our salvation and our eternity and it's called life and that's the part we struggle with. What I want to show you today is that Jesus' job was not just to save us, but to deliver us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, if you are someone who is, has been coming to the Wednesday night Bible study, you know that for a while we studied 1 Corinthians 15. We talked about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, knowing that He delivered us from this, this certain death as far as hell and broken fellowship with God but but there's something else that that's really important it's that his plans are to take us to heaven if you stop living here you start living there so it lets us be able not to fear life not to fear all the things that we normally do so in first Corinthians 15 Paul was talking about Jesus being the resurrection If we read in verses 19, it says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Do you know that that is really a a tragedy in today, in the Christian's mind? Is that their hope, even though they put their hope in God, their hope is really in just the things of this life? I'm good as long as everybody tells me I'm healthy. I'm good as long as I get a clean bill of health. I'm good as long as my finances are good. I'm good as long as me and her aren't aren't arguing. I'm good as long as my kids are behaving. I'm good as long as my job's going well. I'm good as long as the company's doing all right. I'm good as long as my child is performing well. I'm good as long as I'm good as long as I'm good. As long as what? That's so fragile. It can go bad in any way, right? That's what he's saying. If your hope is only in Christ, well, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and so I'm saved. But when life is over, then, yeah, they tell me that I'm going to go to this place out here and there's going to be this great soul sleep. That's the big lie that's being told to everybody. The Bible never says there's soul sleep. As a matter of fact, it says, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he says, to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord, which means that today, if this life leaves me while I'm preaching, and, and I hope this is the spot, not today, mind you, prepared for this sermon, I'd like to get it out, but. But if I leave here, somebody will have to carry my body out of here. You'll go through some things. There'll be a service. You'll put me right out back. But my soul immediately will go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then there'll be a day that we're told at the end of chapter 15 that says that the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him and so shall we be with the Lord. That is the time of my physical resurrection. So he tells me that, yes, I'm in the process of being taken. If I just have hope for this life, I'm a Christian. I accepted the Lord and man, we're criticized. It's hard to be faithful. It's hard to live this Christian life. And people are talking about me. I'm going to struggle on through and I'm going to do my job as a Christian. I'm going to try to share the word. I'm going to be at church when I need to do it. If your hope is only in this life for Christ, then you're going to stay miserable. He gives you something to look forward to past this. And he goes on. He says in verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept? For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. What is he saying? He's saying there's a big part of me, that human part of me, that flesh and blood part of me, that flesh and blood part of you that came from Adam. That part, that part will not last. If that part makes it to 90, they'll probably have something in the paper about you. If it makes it to 100, they'll do every birthday edition with you. Why? Because it just doesn't last. That part doesn't last. But he says, I'm alive in Christ. The part of you that you put in called Jesus Christ that you put in to this fleshly part, that part is made alive. That's a glorious thing. It says, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming. And then look at verse 24. Amazing. It says, then cometh the end when he shall have there's our word, delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. I don't want to put too much emphasis on this right now, but this is our first theme verse we're going to look at. It tells us the end comes. Not when I breathe my last breath. The end comes When Jesus has delivered me to God. Fully delivered me to God. He's put all of his enemies under his feet. I've been delivered. So here's what I want you to see. This struck me. It struck me because as I was looking at this, I I understood that. I, I know when I get saved, I'm part of the kingdom of God. But it let me know that Jesus' ultimate job is to deliver us to God. He doesn't just come to save us. He works to deliver us from our sins. So I want to tell you something. To be delivered is not just to be saved. You say, well, my deliverance is my salvation. At the moment of salvation, Jesus sheds his mercy and grace to you. And here's how we take advantage of it so many times. And I put myself in this category because I've been there too, but I'm watching a lot of mediocre Christians do this right now. So this is a charge to you. We are confident in our salvation. We know that we've been saved and we know that the Bible tells us one day we're going to end up in heaven with God. We stand firm on that. But this in-between part, For some reason, we have it in our mind that we can do this or we can do that or we can go here. We can go there. We can be as faithful as we want to be. We can struggle with this. We can fear. We can worry. That's the part where you're being delivered to God. You see, Jesus is telling us, yes, he saved you. But at the end of all, he will have taken everyone that he saved to the presence of God Almighty. Spirit and body. So stay with me. Our life. The part between us being saved, the the part between us being saved and being in the presence of God is a journey of deliverance. We are actually that possession that has been purchased by the blood of Jesus. And we live this life as someone who's being delivered into the presence of God. So that caused me to ask this question. If I am that package being delivered to God and I I look at my journey how has my life been as a package kind of package you say oh you're reaching well this is the way he led me jump on do I believe he saved me I do God's word said that if I if I cry out to him if I confess my my sins to him if I repent if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that, that I'm saved right I believe that Do I believe that he's going to take me to the presence of God? Yes. Then I am 
by all definition, being delivered, even right now. In my deliverance, I have a different family that you have. I live in a different place than you do. I work at a different place than you do. Every package takes a different kind of journey. They have different kind of obstacles. They have different kind of temptations. But I, got, I began to look at my life as a package, something that Jesus has saved and is important. I've been bought with a price. I was purchased by God Almighty. So Jesus' job is to deliver me to him. And I began to, to think, well, this is not the first time that he was giving this example. I look back in Exodus chapter 3. So turn back to Exodus chapter 3. We're going to go New Testament, Old Testament. As Moses stood at the burning bush. Do you remember Moses standing at the burning bush? How many people in here know that story? Mainly we know the story of Moses standing in front of Pharaoh, right? And all the plagues coming. And then Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. How many people know that part? But before all that happened, Moses received these instructions from God. He stood in front of the burning bush and God spoke to him so clearly. And this is what he told him. Are you in Exodus 3? All right, read this with me. Beginning at verse 6. It says, Moreover, he said, this is God speaking, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and Moses. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down, hold on a second, I am come down to what? To deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, a large unto a fl land flowing with milk and honey, unto a place of the Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and Perizzites and Hivites and Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is coming to me. They're crying what? Help. Say it with me. What are they crying? Help. Isn't that what anybody has to cry when they see that they're lost and they're crying out to Jesus? What do they have to cry? I hear their cry, and I've seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, he's speaking to Moses, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Out of this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, I want to show you the importance of your life as a package that's being delivered to God. Knowing that who is it that is delivering you? It is Jesus that's delivering you. It's Jesus that's delivering me. But I want to focus on verse 8. Verse 8, God tells Moses this, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. You say, well, how does this have context to me? Understand that Egypt, as it's referenced in the Old Testament, is a picture of the world. It's a picture of the world without God. It's basically a picture of a sinful world. And so as we make this, this correlation to us today, we look and we say, okay, we are somebody that God loved, that he has come down to deliver us out of a sinful world. Now, who did he send for us? He sent Jesus. Now listen, and I am come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians. Now listen, this is what I think is so important. And to bring them up and out of that land. I want you to underline up and out. These words, up and out. When I saw this, I began to just have my little jig. I, I, I'm understanding that in the same way that God said, I'm not just going to save you from Egypt and try to change things around you. I'm going to bring you up and out. And you know what God called it? Delivering. You see, God said, I'm going to send my son Jesus. If you cry out for help and I see your suffering, and I see how the world's oppressing you. And your heart is tender and you cry out for help. Then I'm going to come bring you not just up out of your trouble. Remember lifting Pastor, Bra lifting Pastor Blake up? I brought him up, right? I saved him. But when I brought him out, I delivered him. Jesus says, I'm not going to just bring you up. I'm going to bring you out. God said, I'm not just going to bring them up. I'm going to bring them out. And as I, I began to think about this, I, I thought, well, yeah, I've been secure in him bringing me up with salvation. But I have struggled with him bringing me out. There's been a lot of times I have been that package that wasn't hard to, that wasn't easy to carry. 
I've been that package that was slippery. If I think about Jesus' job in delivering me, not go with me here. And Jesus stands before God. And God sent him to bring me up and out and to deliver me. Then when Jesus stands before God, is he going to say, I got him here, but it was rough. I saved him. And then I was leading him saying, hey, do this or do that. But couldn't get him to come. However, now and then by duty, he knew I saved him. So he would come every now and then and worship me. He still wouldn't sing when he came in. Couldn't get him to serve or do anything. And then as soon as somebody else came along, that was more important than me. And his mind would get distracted. And then, listen, Father, as far as trying to battle with bringing him, every time that he would see something that might help his financial condition, he would forget about me and I'd turn around and he's gone. So I'd have to go look for him. Every time that he was tempted in this way of the flesh, well, even though I knew I was telling him the right thing to do, and I was, I was in his heart uh, through the Holy Spirit, and I was speaking to him, he still would do it. This has been a tough package to get to you. You say, oh, well, that's not the way it is. The Bible says we'll stand at the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the things that we've done in our body as a Christian. Can I translate that to you? In relation to today's sermon, we'll give an account to what kind of package we were as we were being delivered to God after our salvation. And if I just focus on my salvation and the end of my salvation, which is standing in front of God, and I don't focus on the delivering part, I'm not going to glorify God in anything that I'm doing. You see, it was not God's purpose to simply save his people from their present condition. It was God's purpose to deliver them to a place of blessing. He said, I'm going to bring you up and out of and to a land flowing with milk and honey. We always relate that to Canaan land being heaven. Listen, Canaan land is the place of blessing that you live in as a child of God. For me to get up this morning and know the doctor told me something yesterday that was terrible. But for me to have that thought that I can come over and say, hey, Pastor Blake, I went to the doctor yesterday. He told me this was wrong with me and he gave me this time. But listen, hey, I got to tell you something. I'm a child of God. And God said he had the hairs on my head numbered. He even knows before I even shave them. He knows me that good, right? He said there's never been a spare that's fallen that he doesn't know where that spare is. He feeds them every day. And he told me not to worry. He said there's a time for me to be born, a time to die. If my time to die is tomorrow then I have peace about it because God said I won't live a second after that so no matter what that doctor tells me if God's got something for me to do here then he's got something for me to do you say what are you describing I'm describing the Canaan land that you can live in a peace if you trust God in all things when you get to that point where you say well my bills don't add up uh, this doesn't add up then I go right back and say in Canaan land then he makes the grapes this big he provides things you can't understand he blows your mind i've had my mind blown so many times canaan land is not just getting to heaven it's a land flowing with milk and honey which means not that he's going to prosper you i'm going to get saved and be a millionaire because there's millionaires that don't have peace i'm going to get saved and give you a peace that passeth all understanding that's canaan i'm going to take you to a large land that's part of the delivery and today If you can honestly say that you've asked Jesus to save you, then you have to know that after he saves you, his mission is to deliver you. Now, after we believe on Jesus for our salvation and we're saved from the penalty of our sins, and you know, the big penalty we think, and and this is how we we equate this thing I'm saved from what? Most all, I'm saved from hell. If you're visiting with us, this is a church where we still say hell. We're not PC. Okay. What did he save me from? He saved me from hell. I don't want to spend eternity in hell. That lake of fire where it's just eternally. No, he saved me from my everyday separation from him. He gave me a chance to have fellowship with him. He saved me from being distant from him. Ultimately, the judgment for not being saved is that I'm condemned and I would go to hell. But the delivery process begins at salvation. 
He saves us to deliver us from this bondage that we're in because of our sin. And and by his sacrifice, yes, he's given us a way to be delivered from hell. But for the rest of our life on earth, as a Christian, we're on a journey in this life as someone who's been purchased by Jesus and someone who is to be delivered by God, or delivered to God by Jesus himself. That's the journey you're on. And as I said before, on your journey, you may work at this place and somebody may work at this place. You may face this physical problem and somebody else may face this physical problem. You may have this challenge in a relationship and some other person. But it's part of your journey. It's part of you being delivered. And a lot of those things are to be able to show you that he can deliver you out of those situations. And a lot of those things are when we have kicked and screamed so hard during the delivery. When we've not been obedient. That we have to see him as deliverer again. I think we Christians think about this process wrong so many times. We think that after we believe on Jesus as our Savior, He writes our name in the Lamb's Book of Life and puts our souls in safekeeping and then makes sure at the end of our lives that we get whisked off to heaven. But what we need to realize is that on our journey of deliverance with Jesus, we're not carried. We follow. We have that picture in our mind. Jesus reached in. He saved me. He's going to carry me to heaven. No, he's not. You've looked at some pictures before of Jesus carrying that lamb. I know. We've got that picture of the footprints in the sand. And when I couldn't walk, you picked me up and carried me. I've had it too. I'm not. Don't go out and say, you talked about my picture in my house. No. That's an accurate picture. Accurate picture. When I couldn't walk, he carried me. Does he pick up the lamb and carry him? Yeah. But he puts it down. He doesn't carry you all the way. You're not some baby. This is the delivery process. We're unlike the package in that Jesus doesn't carry us to God. He says, follow me. He said, follow me ever since he started. To his disciples, he said, follow me. To you, he says, follow me. But we never mature as Christians and we think, okay, we got saved and I'm going to end up in heaven some miraculous way. Jesus is going to get me there so I'll live like I'm going to live. No, you'll live as an obedient package, blessed, enjoying Canaan here on this earth if you follow. Why? Because he said, I'm the light of the world. If a man doesn't follow me, he walks in darkness. He says, I'm the good shepherd. He said, the sheep know my voice. He said, they hear my voice. He calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. In order for us to be delivered the way God wants us to be delivered, then we have to follow, not be carried. Why is this important? Well, I got to jump back in the way we think. Because I had years I thought this way. I am so safe and secure in my salvation. I know the day I got saved, I got saved. And I believe that God says if I got saved, I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. And in my mind, maybe subconscious, but I feel like it's in a lot of Christians' mind because I think a lot of Christians have, part in the, have pro- problems in the delivery process. In my mind, I just thought that I got saved, so for sure I'm going to be there. Yes, I keep messing up, but I'm going to be in heaven, right? What I forgot to to consider is that I do have to follow. Yeah, like that picture when I when I couldn't take it anymore. He picked me down. He picked me up and he carried me. Right? But David doesn't say he reached down and picked me up out of the miry pit. He finishes by saying, Then he set my feet upon a solid rock. Father God won't just pick you up through Jesus. He'll set you back down because it's not your job to ride on his train in his package bag to get to heaven. It's your job to follow him to heaven. How do you follow him? He tells us what to do to follow him. And he puts the Holy Spirit. What an advantage. And that voice, the closer I am to him, the louder that voice is. And when I get down and I'm trying to follow and all of a sudden I'm distracted by this, then the Holy Spirit, if I'm close to God, if I'm worshiping God, if I'm faithful to Him, if I'm praying, if I'm in His Word, that voice is so clear and it says, stop it. Don't you do that. 
And then along with your mind, I don't know how it is with yours, along with that, then my gut starts being bothered, right? I feel nervous inside, right? I feel like, hey, um, you know, I don't feel right. You know what that is? That's when peace has just left me. The Holy Spirit's battling with the voice of the devil who is out to mess up every delivery that Jesus is trying to make. He can't get your soul, but he wants to mess up the package. When your package arrives in heaven, it, he wants it to say, okay, well, listen, here's what happened to Shope's package. You know, yes, he got saved. But then I remember when he went this way, this way, your package looks like it's been beat up and bruised and been all the way to Tasmania and back. It's been stamped by every place in the world. Yes, it's going to get there. But what's it going to look like when you get there? So when I began to see myself as this package, it wasn't an amen. It was an old me. There's a lot of times when I was secure in my package, but I did just jump up in that bag and rest that I'm going to end up in heaven. Hopefully God will understand what I'm doing right now. Oh, I can justify it, but I'll end up there. You see, that, that, it's a pretty big mistake. Because during that time, I had no peace. During that time, I was, I was challenged by, I guess, everything that could steal my joy and happiness. I lived in a state of worry. I lived in a state of fear. You say, you were afraid of things? Oh, not that you could see. Worry. Worry is a, is a result of fear. You see, after we become sheep, he's leading us to everyday fellowship with God while we live on this earth and ultimately into eternal fellowship with God. You see, he leads us as he delivers us and he'll lead me through this day and he'll lead me through the morrow. He'll lead me through the next day. He'll lead me through the next day. And eventually my day will be when I stand in front of God. That's the end. Remember first Corinthians 15, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered us. So you see in this process, right? But are you seeing yourself as a package? You see, we try every other way in the world, but Jesus says, I am the way. Now, I want to tell you, if you hear nothing today but this, please hear this. When someone accepts the gift of salvation from God and confesses to God that they're a sinner, they repent of that sin and they ask God to forgive them and they believe on the blood of Jesus to take away their sin and they ask him to save them, then they're saved. At that point, their deliverance begins as jesus said in john 3 3 except a man be born again he, he can't see the kingdom of god you see after we're saved we're in the process of being taken being delivered to god it might be a day month or year 50 years but we're in the process i love what paul said in first corinthians he says for you're bought with a price therefore glorify god in your body and your spirit which are god's so I want you to understand this picture if you see yourself as a package and you're asking what kind of package I am. You're a package, first of all, if you're saved, you're a package that God bought. You belong to God. He bought it by watching his son. First of all, somebody spit in his face, beat the meat off of his back, ridicule him, crucify him. That's the price that was paid. He became that lamb that shed his blood for you and for me. So there was a price paid for you. So if you accepted his salvation, you're bought by him. You belong to God. As a package, you're supposed to glorify God in your body and in your spirit. That's what he just said, right? Why? Because you're bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself. You see, we're a possession of God that's being delivered to God by Jesus Christ himself. You know, our life's going to have obstacles. It's going to have distractions. It's going to have temptations. But if we follow Jesus, we'll not only get delivered to God, our journey of deliverance will glorify God. You say, well, it's too late for me. I've had enough times to where I'm not going to have anything good said about me. I, I'm not going to have a good report. Listen, I want to tell you something, pal. You wouldn't still living and be living and breathing as a Christian on this earth if God didn't have something else for you to do. The fact that you're here today and you can take a breath means God's not done with you. Don't say at this point I've messed up too much. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If I confess my sins, He's faithful and just to forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I can be clean today. That's the blood of Jesus. It cleanses and then He'll have something for me to do. That's why you're still here. Now, there's something pretty big deal about deliverance that I begin to see in so many places in the Bible. It, it's something that I need to ask for help with. 
Even in the Lord's Prayer, do you know that Jesus taught us to pray? Now, it wasn't the prayer that you're supposed to always just pray. The Lord, this is my prayer, the Lord's Prayer. It was an example, a model for you to pray. Do you remember the end of the Lord's Prayer that we hear? Matthew 6, 10. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Do you know that there is an evil person that is trying to mess up the everyday delivery that Jesus is making of me to God and you to God? Who is this evil individual? The Bible calls him your adversary, the devil, right? He wants to mess it up. So in order for me to secure this, this perfect way that I'm trying to come to the Lord, knowing that I, I have this, this ability to mess up at all times, I need to ask God even for help in my delivery. Not just being saved, but my delivery. Well, what do I need to do? Hey, Lord, lead me not to temptation, but deliver me from evil. Save me even from, from the problems that are happening in my delivery. If we accept Jesus as our Savior, understand we become a child of God. But I need you to understand this one thing that will hopefully tie all this together. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. For all those people that are so Bible literate right now that you're saying, well, I can't even believe that you're looking at us as a package and you know, he does save us and that delivery is all wrapped into that. And so he delivered us when he saved us. I want to get on Paul's heels here. And Paul's a pretty smart fellow. God called him to preach, and he said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, very first chapter, listen. He says, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves, verse 9. Are you there? We had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Listen. Who delivered us. Hold on, hold on a second. Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver. Hold on a second. You mean deliver means he has delivered, he is delivering, and he will keep delivering? Absolutely. Until when? The end. Boy, that's good. Because if I see myself as that package... I'm not going to look back when he delivered me and say, glory to God, I remember that night that he saved me and everything's just been a bowl of peaches since this. No! I've been on a journey of deliverance. I remember getting tempted and tested. And so he delivered me then, but today he might have to deliver me because I'm weak and I want to go back this way and my mind wants to go back and I want to fear, so I need delivering today. And then, what's going to come up next week? I'm going to need to be delivered then too. He keeps, he has delivered, he is delivering. He will continue to deliver until the end. Glory to God. You are living as a Christian in a process of deliverance, but your deliverance hasn't begun until you accept the Lord Jesus as your salvation. That is the the beginning of your deliverance. I need to roll this back to, to Moses if I can. You see, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we become that child of God. We become the same as the children of God that That God said, well, I'm going to bring my children up and out, right? It doesn't mean that we'll not have times that we feel like things aren't going to work out. It's during those times that we see God deliver us and we we learn to have faith in his power. Do you know that my journey as a Christian, my journey of deliverance as a Christian, is him continually showing me that he has the power to deliver me? I don't have a problem. And, And this is the dynamic of this message I want you to get because I think so many Christians struggle with it. I do not have a problem believing that he saved me. Do you? I don't have a problem believing I'm going to go to heaven and spend eternity. Do you? But I have daily problems trusting that he'll deliver me from this situation or that situation. Can I get a witness, right? So my problem is not in the salvation, it's in the delivery. So I look back and I think, hey, he was telling them this. And then they, he picked them up and got them out of Egypt. He sent those plagues. And so they left and they had all the, the, their, their animals and everything with them. And they put out millions of people. They were going and as they struck out across here, all of a sudden they got these days journeys into this. And all of a sudden... It was like, hey, we're going to go. There's a mountain over there. and Here's a mountain over here. So we must just keep going right down this way. 
read Exodus 13 and 14 sometimes, and it'll tell you about the two mountains being on either side. And, hey, they went down between these two mountains, and God had already said, I'm going to put a cloud here by the day, and it's going to give you. You can only go as far as the cloud leads you. I'm going to put fire by night, so I'm going to deliver you. This is just stay with me. Follow me. Follow the cloud. Follow the, right? Same as us. Follow me. And then he led them right to the Red Sea. And then all of a sudden, a bunch of those packages, those people started saying, oh, what, there weren't enough graves in Egypt? We had to come out here to be killed? Look at this, the Red Sea. And then they did what we do sometimes. They looked and saw the mountains on this side, the mountains on this side, the sea in front of them and Pharaoh behind them and said, hey, we're done for. Listen, if God said he was going to bring them and deliver them to Canaan, to the land of milk and honey, that's what he was going to do. This was a test of deliverance and you and me go through it every single day. But you know, we've listened to some people, so we always try to, to get our options. I'm like they are sometimes, right? I look and, and here's what somebody's told you. Hey, Take that passage of scripture where God said, if you speak to that mountain, you can move that mountain by your faith. I believe that, but sometimes God doesn't want to move that mountain. God didn't move the mountain for them. They couldn't escape because they'd have to go up and over the mountain. That would take a lot, right? But technically they could have done it if he would have kept that cloud there. I don't want to throw a wrench in it, but think about it. They could have went over that mountain, right? If he would have kept them at bay. But God said on that day, I'm not going to move this mountain that you won't move. I'm not going to move this mountain. I'm going to blow your mind and move the sea. <laughs> Nobody could do that. Not even with their effort, right? So in God's delivery of you and me, it's no different. If he wants you to a certain place, he will get you there. And all you have to say is, I will follow And the right kind of package that's living in the will of God is just saying, I will follow. I won't fear. I trust you. I have to bring verse 10 into this because this is big. Go back to Exodus 3. We're going to close with verse 10. This is a big deal. I'm going to wrap it up. Very end, I want you to see something that was important. It was impactful for me to see, and I hope that you see the same thing. God shows us about our deliverance. When you look back at verse 10, after he gets through telling Moses this at the bush, look what he says. Come now, therefore. Can I translate that to, to today's language? Moses, come on. And I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. <laughs> hey, Moses, come on. It sounds good, doesn't it? Guess what? You're my package that's going to help deliver all the other packages. Do you know that God doesn't just save you to save you? He doesn't just save you to deliver you. He saves you to deliver you so that on your delivery, you can help someone else be delivered. Isn't that what Moses did? Come now. Come on. Why? Well, I'm going to send you that you may bring forth my people out of Egypt. Do you know that God will use us as packages? But not if we're just thinking about our salvation, securing it, and just thinking about where we're going to end up. If we're not thinking about the delivery, how can he use you to help somebody else? He can't. I can testify to that. I've been in that, that spot where I was just like, okay, I'm in the bag. I'm in the bag. I've got this salvation in the bag. Get... Is that not a thought you've had? I know I've messed up, but I'm saved. It's kept me from repenting before. The thing about how secure I am by, by believing the beginning and the end. The delivery is the middle. That's what I struggle with. What kind of package am I? What kind of package are you? Are you even a package yet? In order to, to be delivered to God, you have to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have to accept His salvation to begin to be delivered. After that, the delivery process starts. Today, this message will hit you and you'll find yourself in one of these positions. You'll find yourself as saved and being delivered or unsure whether you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. 
If you've never accepted the Lord as your Savior, you have doubts, you're not even sure about that, then we don't even need to talk about the delivery yet. You need to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior today. Know that He died for you, He loves you, and He will take you to God Himself. You do that by crying out help to Him today. and Asking Him to come into your heart, to use His blood to cover your sin today. And if you want someone to pray with you, I'll be standing right down here. I would love to pray with you. You can accept the Lord Jesus Christ today and be his special package that can follow him all the way to God and bring glory to him and live the rest of this life, hey, with challenges and problems, but peace in the midst of them. But Christian, if you've done that today, but you realize life gets busy and it gets complicated, and your eyes get off of them and As a package, no, you haven't maybe followed like you need to. You've got distracted, and so it's been a hard journey. If he's carrying me as a package, boy, I've done some kicking, and I've done some squirming. It's been pretty tough. What's he going to say to me when he puts me in front of God? Have I brought glory to him on the journey, on my journey of deliverance? Have you brought glory to him on your journey of deliverance? You say, well, I I haven't. I've tried to a little bit. Come and talk to him about it. He's showing you yourself today. Come make it right with God today. He's got you here today living another day so that you can make a difference. And on that journey, are you a package that's bringing other packages? You know, as a dad, I need to be thinking about the packages that are my children. I've been giving them as my life, not to just raise them and then be uh, just products of my home. They're packages that I was given. Is it my priority to make sure those packages get where they need to? What about my wife? Wife's the husband, friends to friends. That's what we're given a responsibility to do on our journey. Help deliver others. It's like Moses. Where does the message find you today? Well, I'm going to tell you where you can find him. On your knees at the end of a prayer. The altar's open. Come and talk to him. If you're unsure of your salvation, come and talk to me. I want to pray with you. I want to make sure you don't leave here as something being undelivered. If you're saved, you just need to talk to him. Make things right with him. Father God, I love you. I praise you and I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word that finds us where we're at. I pray, God, that you would continue to minister through this invitation. Lord, this is the sacred time. I pray, God, that you would just let us not be distracted by anything in our mind. Lord, let us focus on you. Lord, pierce hearts right now. Let the Holy Spirit move in and out of every pew. I pray, God, that we can see ourselves in the condition we are as a package of yours, Lord. Let us be able to see ourselves. Show us ourselves, Lord. And if repentance is needed, I pray, God, that you would call us to repentance today. And at the end of those prayers, Lord, that you would put a peace, Lord, that's indescribable upon every person that asks you for that, that forgiveness. I pray, God, that communication between you and each one that's heard this message, Lord, will just be vibrant today. And I pray, God, that you would save souls. Let no one leave here, Lord, that's heard the the invitation for them to be saved. Let no one leave here lost. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me?
glory to God, it was good to come to the house of the Lord today, wasn't it? Can I give you some encouraging news? You've been a great package today. Because you followed the Lord to church. It wasn't the devil that told you to come and you listened. He wanted you to come here and worship him and hear him speak today. He wanted you to, to be able to, to read out of his word. And he wanted to be able to have you sing praises. So you followed today. Now the rest of the day is on you. Right? And then, and then tonight at 6 we'll come in. We'll, we'll praise him. We'll follow you. You've already seen Brother Barry come in. You don't know what's going to happen tonight. Right? <laughs> so... Praise God. We're going to laugh together tonight. We're going to praise the Lord together. You don't want to miss it. Come tonight, and uh, I know we'll have a good time in the Lord. So good to have Pastor Blake back. Uh, he's been on vacation. I missed him. I know you missed him. And so well, it's just great to have him back in here. I'm going to ask him to close us in prayer.